I can't imagine uh, a crowd this large unless I owe half of you money. <laughs> January 1967 for basic training at Fort Jackson. <laughs> we arrived just before dawn. I was cold. My mother had told me this was the tropics. <laughs> and the welcome, I spent my first hours as part of a ragtag line of recruits walking across a parade field picking up cigarette butts. So, you can't imagine how much more I am gladdened by this one <laughs> than I was by that. I covered the White House with Charles back when politicians of both parties actually enjoyed one another's company and occasionally agreed on matters of substance. You may remember those days if you're old enough. He was always a step ahead of everyone else one of those reporters who could peek further over the horizon than the rest of us. But Charles contacted me, as he said last November, about being here tonight. The film Spotlight had just opened. The critics were swooning, but that was easy to disregard. They were all journalists. <laughs> and it had been a decade or more since journalists had anything to cheer about. So he asked me to come down in March. I wondered whether anyone would even remember the movie by March. We are, after all, talking about a relatively low-budget indie film. It has no car chases, no shootings, no explosions. There is not even a bare midriff. <laughs> um, but once again, your dean had seen over the horizon. As he mentioned 16 days ago, my wife is keeping count, uh, because she was there with me. 16 days ago, the movie, Who Wanna Fuck It, won Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. Uh, have many of you seen the film? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a few days before the Oscar voting, I had lost faith. The pundits were predicting that The Revenant, despite all the gore and violence, would be named Best Picture. Many of you have seen that? I went, I went on to Twitter, um, where I seldom venture to communicate my despair. team that I'm here to talk about, and uh, briefly enough, I hope that you get to have your say too. Uh, on this matter, I obviously have some detailed first-hand knowledge. I led the team that broke the code. Uh, it took an 18-month chunk out of my life. I remember what we did. I know how and why the film was made. I know the actors quite well. Michael Keaton is among my BFFs. <laughs> um, and I can tell you the differences between what's in the film and what happened in real life. I can even tell you, if you're interested, how George Clooney and Matt Damon almost ended up starring in the film. <laughs> the film is about real life investigative reporting that happened to make a difference, a big difference. Alas, it is the kind of investigative reporting that is not being done at most newspapers anymore. A
substantially of the precipitous drop in revenue that has beset pretty much every news organization. Now that I'm on record emphasizing the importance and the impact of investigative reporting, let me add a small caveat. It is undeniable that a good film, which this one is, can have a much greater impact than the printed word. For someone like myself, who always believed in the primacy and the power of a front page story, that's taken some getting used to. The, react the reaction in 2002 to our original stories surprised us. Our articles went viral on the internet. In fact, I believe that our investigation was the first major investigative series of the internet age. I could be challenged on that, but I believe that to be true. Uh, the stories had a major impact both in the United States and abroad, but already the film has provoked a much stronger reaction. In 2002, when our stories were roiling the church, it would have been unimaginable for any bishop to urge Catholics to read our reporting. Fast forward to today. Cardinal Sean O'Malley, the head of the Vatican Commission on Sexual Abuse, has called the film important and powerful. And Cardinal O'Malley's commission sat down together in Rome and watched it. The Catholic bishops in Australia, where sexual abuse by priests was commonplace, issued a statement last month urging all Catholics to see the film. After the Oscars, the Vatican newspaper praised the film. Already, hundreds of new victims who remained in the shadows in 2002 have decided to come forward. I and my colleagues receive emails every day from people around the world who were abused by priests. On Sunday, I even had an email from a 22-year-old Iranian man who had been molested by a mullah. And most of the time when I speak publicly about this issue, someone who was a victim approaches me to talk about it. Often, when any of us go to see a movie, all we get out of it is a ticket stub and a sense of disbelief that popcorn could cost so much. <laughs> this time, this time we have a film that might make a difference in people's lives, that might even prompt a church that moves at a glacial pace to quicken that pace and institute long overdue and long promised reforms. So for me, as much as I want to focus solely on the journalism, it is hard to ignore the film and how it was made. So I want to talk about the film as well as the journalism. But first, let me summarize, if I can, what we actually did in 2002, to the extent that I actually remember it. <laughs> uh, and some of these details may differ somewhat from the film. But I want to, I'd like to go over these uh, uh, fairly quickly. First of all, nothing happened, really, until we got a new editor. That's in the film. Marty Barron came to the Globe from the Miami Herald. He came from a state where everything is public. And he came to a state, Massachusetts, where virtually nothing is public. He was a newcomer. He had a fresh pair of eyes. He was not acculturated to the city, the newspaper, or the system under which we operated. He was the first editor of the Globe who did not come up through the ranks. And his very first day, at his very first news meeting, he raised the issue of a column that had appeared the day before by Eileen McNamara about the lawsuits against one priest, 84 lawsuits against Father John Gagan. And he, he asked, what are we doing about this? And he looked out over a room full of people, of deers in the headlight, deer in the headlight. <laughs> because nobody had thought what he instantly thought. Why don't we go to court and get the records of this priest? Because everybody said, we, we, the judge made the decision. Why, why would we challenge that? Nobody had thought. Uh, to do that. By that afternoon, he had already called in legal counsel to begin 
to prepare a, a, a motion uh, to seek access to those records, and and he, he took a step. Um, he called me in and Ben Bradley Jr. and he asked the spotlight team, the investigative team I headed, to look into the case of this one priest to see if we could find out what the church really knew. Uh, for a group of journalists who were used to dealing with official corruption, that was a bit of a uh, a bit of a surprise. So I went down and I talked to my reporters. It turns out, by the way, all four of us were raised Catholic, um, which helped. And, and partly out of fear of the new boss, instead of uh, going right at Gagan, we decided to call anybody we could think of who knew anything at all about sexual abuse of children within our circulation area. And that involved a lot of lawyers, uh, a lot of victims' rights advocates, and, and, and that sort of thing. And within a week, this is not in the film, I met with two lawyers downtown Boston to talk about this issue, and they told me that the church had made a large number of settlements, secret settlements, never near a courthouse, uh, that were intended to keep the sins of the priest, or the crimes of the priest, I should say, a secret. And one of these lawyers referred to the payments as hush money. And I went back, and, and we, we went back to Marty Barron, the editor, told him what we found, and he said, go for it. And at that time, we thought we were dealing with a story that perhaps there were a dozen or 15 priests in there. Subsequently, we, we had a victim come in to see us, Phil Saviano, who's in the film, and he gave us the names of, I believe, 13, uh, 13 priests that he was aware of and connected us to victims, and we began the long, slow slog of trying to get people to talk uh, to, talk to us. Um, then came 9-11. And uh, we were in the middle of this investigation, but like every other newspaper in the country, we had to drop what we were doing and take our investigative team and aim it at what had happened. Two of those planes, as you may remember, flew out of Boston's Logan Airport on that morning. And, uh, and that's reflected in the film. We just had to drop this story for five or six weeks. Uh, so we, we went forward. With the story, uh, we networked with victims. Uh, it was very difficult sometimes getting people to talk to us, to trust us. Uh, we spent an enormous amount of time knocking on doors, and a lot of times people just closed the doors in our faces, a lot, a lot of time. Um, and then we had, and we had this, what I think is a pivotal moment for all of us, and it's certainly, I think, a pivotal scene in the film where we had our oracle, Richard Sight, the former priest, who actually did come to Boston at one point uh, that fall, but in that conference call where he, uh, he told us that, in his view, 6% of all priests had offended, and that, that really, and, 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 and it comes across in the film, it, it left us stunned that, it, that the number could potentially be be that high. Um, so we spent uh, and then an enormous amount of time trying to create our own database. This, by the way, was my very first spreadsheet. <laughs> um, was not our, Matt Carroll, our computer assistant reporting guy, knew spreadsheets, but uh, we had a moment one day in the office where he was entering the data and I went over and I looked over his shoulder and there were these vertical lines and these horizontal lines and I said, what's that? And he said, that's a spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, I'm dating myself. Uh, but, but, but that wasn't, that, that effort uh, to compile that database wasn't the only uh, difficult uh, hurdle uh, we had to overcome. We, we obtained from the court system, nowadays you could do this a lot easier online, but we obtained from the court system the docket numbers uh, 
1,500 docket numbers of about 30 lawyers who might have had handled sexual abuse cases at some point. And we had to go through 1,500 court cases. And we found a bunch of lawsuits that had been filed. And what we also found is that after they were settled, judges had impounded every single case at the request of the archdiocese in violation of the court's own rules. Uh, and that was a major uh, finding for us. And we also, there was a 25-room mansion that some Catholic uh, gentleman and his wife had donated to the church in the town of Milton, uh, which as the crow flies was about 300 yards from my house. And um, we found out that the priest was where, the church was warehousing uh, priests who had abused children at this mansion. And uh, I went to the town clerk's office in the town of Milton and asked for the annual census, and 15 or 18 of the priests had uh, very obligingly uh, listed their, their names, dates of birth, and all of that on the town census over a period of several years, and that gave us more names. So this went on for, uh, for five months, and then we published our first story, and. Uh, January 6th of 2002, and I would like to, uh, if I can do this, I know I can do it, uh, play, I'd like to play a scene. This one. This is the last scene in the film, I want to make a point. You do know it's Sunday, right? I get a tea time. No pickers. Yeah. Probably still a church. Wow. Hey, Linda. It's quiet, huh? Yeah, easiest overtime I ever made. Phone hasn't rung once. Marty said two of mine down to spotlight. Great article, guys. Thank you. Thanks. We published 600 articles in 2002. We added four other reporters within a month or six weeks because the story had become so big. And the phone's ringing off the hook. In the several weeks after that first story, we received phone calls from more than 300 victims just in the Boston Archdiocese. most of whom, when we talked to them, thought that they were the only ones this had ever happened. Most of whom had never told anyone that this had happened. Certainly not their parents or their siblings. And many of them wanted to go public right away. And we had to actually dissuade them. Um, the, the, the calls obviously led to many, many stories, the identities of many other priests. But the, the, it, it, was, it was the most 
emotionally wrenching reporting that any of us had, had ever done. Uh, um, the story that sticks mostly in my mind, uh, I got a call from an 87-year-old man in Millinocket, Maine, who was a great-grandfather. And he was calling to tell me that he had been abused by a priest in 1926, 75 years earlier. And he'd lived his entire life with this and had never told anyone. These, these were the, this is the kind of damage that was done, done to people. And uh, I remember when I was uh, a young journalism student, I, there was a textbook called Objective Reporting. Not possible. Fair reporting, possible. Objective, hard to be, particularly on a story. Uh, a story like this. Uh, we kept at it until April of 2003. So it was about, about uh, 18 or 20 months. So the director of this film, Tom McCarthy, took that first five months of our work and he distilled it into two hours and eight minutes. <laughs> In doing so, he managed probably by design, to make our work seem exciting. <laughs> Spotlight as an edge-of-your-seat thriller. <laughs> now, real investigative reporting is almost never exciting. If you saw the real reporting up close, you wouldn't be on the edge of your seat. You'd be sound asleep in your seat. Indeed, one of the most dramatic moments in the film comes when Keaton decides, as I did, that the team should use the church's annual directories to build its own database of priests who were likely sexual predators. In the film, that work is portrayed in a fast-paced montage, three minutes long, that flashes from one to another of us as we pour through decades of directories, plucking incriminating information to build a spreadsheet of suspect priests. In real life, that work took four of us three and a half weeks. I damn near had a mutiny on my hand. <laughs> yes, good investigative stories are riveting to read, but the reporting that goes into them is often boring, monotonous, tedious, stupefying, mind-numbing, sleep-inducing, even constipating. <laughs> my colleague, Matt Carroll, calls the movie Truthful Fiction. What he means, I asked him, and I think we agree, what he means is that the filmmakers strove for authenticity. It is very accurate as it portrays what happened at the Globe, how we approached the story, the reporting steps we took, and the personalities involved. Of course, there are invented scenes designed to further the narrative. There are composite characters. One example, the lawyer, Jim Sullivan, so well played by the actor Jamie Sheridan. He is a composite of about six different lawyers. All of them, after much soul searching, confirm for us the number of priests for whom the church made secret papers. One reason journalists like the film is because it feels authentic to them. Clueless reporters stumbling around in the dark, trying to figure out whether there is a story, then trying to determine its dimensions, then being dumbstruck to learn the story is much different and much bigger than they could have imagined. If that has a ring of familiarity, it is because that happens pretty much all the time in every newsroom even on daily stories. The filmmakers were so intent on getting the little details right that there is a framed photo of my real daughter on the fake Walter Robinson's desk. <laughs> that desk is in an exact replica of the Spotlight Team offices that was built so that we couldn't recognize the difference 
in a rented Sears, a vacant Sears warehouse in Toronto, where most of the film was shot. Next to that spotlight office, they built a replica of the entire Globe Newsroom. Eight ninths the size. I said to the production designer, I said, why eight ninths? Why not go all the way? <laughs> Never got a, an answer. <laughs> um, for the scenes that were shot in that fake newsroom, the sound editors dubbed in ambient noise that they collected in the real newsroom in Boston. The screenwriter and the director were so intent on the details, and I'm getting to substance here, is that they wanted and they got all of the contemporaneous emails from 2001, provided by not my computer assisted reporting guy, but by me. I had kept them. They wanted all of our original documents. In fact, there's one scene in the film that is verbatim. It's a scene that actually in real life never happened. It's when Marty Baron sits with us and tells us he needs us to get at the pattern and practice of the Archdiocese. That, those words spoken by Liev Schreiber are word for word out of an email that Marty Baron sent to me in August of 2001. So that kind of detail was, was important um, to the filmmakers. But you cannot get everything right. Michael Keaton looks like he stepped out of a fitting room at Brooks Brothers. <laughs> when I pass Brooks Brothers, I keep on going to Macy's. <laughs> and, and, I, and I said, and I, complained, I said, I haven't had a crease in my trousers since the Carter administration. <laughs> but I'm a, new, I'm a newspaper guy. Um, the film is authentic enough that people sometimes get art and life mixed up. Last fall, a woman called me from L.A. She wanted me to do a story. It was about a religious cult nearby in Southern California. She was articulate. She sounded credible. She said she had documents. So I said to her, you're in California. I'm in Boston. Why would you call me? Her response? Because I watched the, tra the trailer for Spotlight this morning, and I decided you were the reporter who should do this story. <laughs> I probably should have given her a Keaton cell number. <laughs> I, uh, anyway, as I said, the, re the work reporters do to get the story is only rarely as interesting as the story itself. Which is why we were taken aback in 2008 when two producers approached us about making the film. Fourteen years ago, the stories we did were the stories. Back then, how we made the sausage in the, the New Yorker last, uh, last week. How we made the sausage was a matter of little interest or significance, even inside the globe. Rightly, the focus was on the stories, not on us. Fifteen months later, when we won the Pulitzer, hardly anyone was interested in how we did it. But as boring as much of our work was, we came to work energized every day for one simple reason. As I said, we knew early on we were on to a story of, to us, unimaginable importance, and that drove us. So we chipped away day in and day out, not unlike someone standing in front of a granite wall with a chisel and a hammer. Small wonder then that we were skeptical when Hollywood first came calling. Sasha Pfeiffer, my colleague, was the biggest skeptic. She was convinced Hollywood would sensationalize what we had done. And for a time, we feared she was right. The subject matter was grim enough that some wanted to spice it up. At one point, the draft screenplay, as is customary, was sent to a Hollywood script consultant. The consultant read it and recommended that a sexual or romantic affair be added. <laughs> Sasha, of course, was most alarmed 
as the only woman on the team. She knew that any such scene was likely to involve her character. Tom McCarthy, the director, rejected doing that or anything like it out of hand. The film was a tough sell in Hollywood. Tough subject matter, popular new pope to cite just two barriers. Had it not been for good fortune, producers with persistence, and a little coincidence, it would never have been made. The best film of the year almost didn't get made. If this behind the scenes intrigue interests you, just ask. So that's the film. What about the real journalism? And the question that comes up, and it's worth a, a long discussion, if we can stay here till 10.30. <laughs> is it possible nowadays to do this kind of investigation? And my answer to that is yes, of course it is. In fact, many investigations nowadays can be done faster. Reporting that once took months to do can now sometimes be done in days or a week or two. And beyond what we reported, did we learn anything about reporting about ourselves? Some lessons to us obvious. The Catholic Church, which is secretive and does not have to file anything, is as tough a nut to crack as exists. Yet we managed to do it. And we did it because many people with small pieces of a very large puzzle were willing to help, though most often not initially. And we were able to persuade them to help because we met with them face to face. If we had adopted accepted 21st century communications techniques, email, texts, tweets, maybe something really personal like a phone call, we might still be waiting for people to cooperate. The best stories do not come to you. You have to go to them. From the church experience, we learned that we'd spent too many years looking for stories in the wrong places. Like other investigative teams, we typically focused our firepower on government wrongdoing and official corruption. We'd not paid heed to the less obvious, victimized populations, people with whom journalists have little in common who get run over by society, those who have no voice but for the one we can provide. And we don't have to wait for a whistleblower to alert us to those stories. All we need to do is look around us. Given everything that's gone wrong for journalism since we did our reporting, the film may seem quaint. It's been called an ode to something that once was, but is no more. So to many, Spotlight will be remembered mostly as a eulogy to a departed loved one. There is reason enough for all this pessimism. The continuing economic erosion at newspapers is to blame, though clueless publishers have surely helped accelerate the freefall. The internet has stripped traditional news organizations of most of their revenue. Advertisers have pretty much abandoned us, and there's no sign that they're coming back. So editors have been forced to make painful cuts in the size of their staffs. The Globe, for instance, in the year 2000, had 550 editorial department employees. Today, it's 315. But our staff remains 50% larger than that of similar sized papers in Philadelphia, Atlanta, and Dallas. In making those cuts, I would argue, editors have sometimes been penny wise and pound foolish in where they target the cuts. At most newspapers, though not at the Globe, editors have decided that investigative reporting is a luxury we can no longer afford. That, to me, is wrong. In fact, investigative reporting is a necessity we cannot afford to do without. When newspaper readers are asked in surveys what they care most about, it is investigative reporting, reporting that holds powerful institutions and individuals accountable. If we do not do this reporting, who will? 
me, our inability to do more aggressive reporting does not stem from a lack of resources. It stems more from a lack of will. And a misunderstanding of what's important to our readers, what matters most to our society, and how best we can fulfill our responsibility in a democracy. The internet has been our double-edged sword. Yes, it has hollowed out our newsrooms, but it has also given us numerous reporting tools that make investigative reporting much faster and more efficient. One example, several times my students at Northeastern University, where I taught investigative reporting for seven years, dug up page one stories in an hour or two simply by browsing different publicly available databases. If you can't tell, I am an evangelist for investigative journalism. And I draw much of my optimism from those students. During the seven years I taught, from 2007 to 2014, my students produced 26 investigative stories for the Globe, all of them on page one. During those years, I remained a consultant to the Globe and kept my office. The distance between the newsroom and the classroom was four miles. The real difference was much greater. At the Globe, the mood was and remains glum, and the future is seen only as bleak. At the university, students were and remain excited about the possibilities of a world that is being remade, one that they, including students here, will help remold. They needed little motivating. Like many of the students here, they loved a good story. They were dogged. They learned where to go to get information. They learned, sometimes with great difficulty, how to persuade people to talk. And most of all, they came to understand that good reporting can right many wrongs. That good reporting is often the only light that illuminates life's dark, darkest corners. Back then, before the movie, I told my students, stick with journalism. There is nothing in life more fun, more rewarding than digging for the truth and finding stories that the people in power don't want us to know about. Doing good journalism is a life worth living. It is, I believe, infinitely more fulfilling than making it into the top 1%. Given what's happened to myself and my colleagues recently, I would now add this. If you do reporting that makes a difference in people's lives, someone might come along and make a film that immortalizes your work. <laughs> and believe me, if lightning like that could strike myself and my colleagues, it can strike any journalism student anywhere. Thank you very much. Now it's your turn. <laughs> yes, sir. A question. You said everybody on your team was raised Catholic. I suspect, given what's portrayed in the movie, there are an awful lot of Catholics in the newsroom as a whole. Any victims? Uh, only one that I know of at the Globe. One of our sports writers uh, was went to what what was then called a minor seminary, where kids went during high school. And he, he was abused, and he went, he became very public about it. Uh, when I say only one, there, there may be others that, that I don't know. Yes, please. First of all, welcome to the University of North Carolina. Um, I did see the movie. I absolutely loved it. Um, as you stated, and in the movie, it talks about how 9-11 occurred, and you had to postpone your investigative reporting in regards to this. How did that personally make you feel? Well, uh, we're, we're, we're journalists, and that story was of such overriding importance in every newsroom that I don't think we, we really didn't participate.
cuts. I mean, we had to get involved, and we did get involved. And there was, there was a lot of reporting that had to be done in a hurry. So that, that happened. Uh, but, but it was, you know, it was five or six weeks. Uh, and uh, in fact, some of the victims we had been talking to were actually upset with us, the movie portrays it. Yes? You're talking about um, you know, how investigative reporting was done back when the um, spotlight team was and now how it looks with the internet. In terms of like, I know we, when I was growing up, when I, growing up, when I was kind of doing internships and, and writing, we always had to fact check and, and, and go through a lot of research. And the internet has made that easier, but do you think that kind of actually doing a lot more reading and that, um, um, depending only on the internet. Do you think that it's kind of a, a balance of doing both nowadays? Because sometimes when you hear about stories that come out of the internet, but people don't fact check them, and then they found out later on that um, some of the information was wrong. Is that, do you feel as, a, as an editor that people have to do both? You know, not just rely on the internet, but also go to actual other sources? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with you. I, I think one of the problems, in some ways, it's a blessing and a curse, the, the internet leaving aside the economics of what it's done, is that um, it, it's easy for reporters now to never leave their desks. Actually, it was never that hard to say your desk by it. so <laughs> It's easier now because so much of the information that, that you want, you can get more quickly, but you can get it without having to go down to the Registry of Deeds, where you might meet someone who might tip you off to another story, for instance. and and. And I don't think this is a particular problem in newsrooms, but I, I, it certainly is for the general public. Uh, reporters usually are pretty savvy at knowing which databases or online sources they can trust and which they can't. And I, I think um, too many people in the general populace tend not to uh, be able to make those distinctions. In the film, at the end, um, there's an emphasis on what was going on in the newsroom, like what was going on in the church that kept the story from being pursued earlier. Yeah. For the journalists among us, and I'm a former religion editor, what was the mindset at the Globe, and what might be the mindset in other stories in other newsrooms? to keep us from doing what the hell we have to do with the time. That's a very good question. And uh, first of all, uh, every archdiocese in, in the country has something in common. They all have a major newspaper within a few miles. And every newspaper, there were clues that, that, this, was, that this was going on. Now, I have to say, stories about priests who abuse children are not new. They were not new in 2001. But across the country, when cases did crop up publicly, the bishops and the archbishops and the cardinals argued with great effectiveness that this was a one-off situation, and we've taken care of Father, and you don't have to worry about it. And we're no worse than the Methodists or the Lutherans. The fact of the matter is, they were a lot worse. And in Boston, close to 10% of all priests abused children over a 50-year period. Um, so there were clues. I mean, when you think about it, it's unimaginable that the Cardinal Archbishop of Boston or any other city could be engaged in what really was an international criminal conspiracy to hide the crimes of thousands of priests who abused some multiple, tens of thousands of children. And powerful and, people abusing and, the least power. And it taught all of us a lesson that the institutions in our society that we value the most, that we look to most for, for guidance and moral leadership are run by fallible human beings who need the same kind of scrutiny as our government institutions, I want to say, receive or should receive. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the more interesting things about Francis's reign as Pope is that 
while he could probably defrock hundreds of pre bishops around the world for their complicity in this pedophilia. He's done none of that. And I wonder, it's my impression, and I could be wrong, and I'd like your point of view, why the press in general has given him a free pass on this. I don't think he's had a free pass uh, from people paying close attention. The problem is there aren't that as many journalists paying close attention. The, the, the Pope, and, and I don't want to get into murky, dangerous religious waters here, but the Pope uh, is clearly trying to move the church forward in a number of areas, and there's a, a, a I mean, you don't have to read a lot to know that there's a major battle within the Vatican. Right. He's meeting an enormous amount of resistance. And we do know that Cardinal O'Malley's commission, which is supposed to deal with this, has been frustrated by other seats of power within the Vatican in trying to do its work. We also know that, that the Pope probably wants to do better than his two predecessors, who really, frankly, were part of the problem, um, uh, has, has sent some mixed signals. I mean, he recently uh, appointed a bishop in Chile who is known to have covered up for numerous priests to abuse right. children. So it's, uh, you know, there's signs of hope, but there's, there's as you say, there's a lot of resistance. It is a political institution. But for that one appointment that you just mentioned, for that appointment, why wasn't there international outrage amongst the press? Well, I, you know, I've read a lot about it, but, uh, but you're right, it hasn't received the, the kind of coverage that, that it deserves. I think, uh, yes, over here. With regards to the cover-up, it seems both in the film and what you told us tonight that it was looking at what was happening within the court system and the sealing of those documents that was telling you the extent of the problem might be more great, or at least the pressure applied to something outside of the church was overwhelming in terms of the scope that you might not understood. My question is, what hurdles to transparency back then did you have to overcome that we didn't necessarily see in the film, but perhaps more pertinent to now, what role do journalists play in our co contemporary society to push for transparency? Okay, on, on the first question, uh, when we discovered what, what had a remember, the vast majority of these cases were settled without going near a courthouse. That the lawyers knew that by going directly to the archdiocese with their victim, they got a bigger payout than if they went to court. And, and, and because the documents that came gushing out by court order in 2002, uh, there, there were hundreds of pages of documents about the church's first priority was to keep this secret, not to damage the reputation of the church. That was the first priority. There was almost never any mention of documents made for the plight of the, the victims, the children. Um, in the case of those cases which I mentioned which went to court, where lawyers actually sued and settlements were reached without going to trial, uh, in all of those cases, the church's attorney, when they went before the judge, asked that the records be impounded, i.e. as if the case never even existed. And the lawyers for the plaintiffs almost always agreed because they had gotten their settlement and it was one single case. And in all of these cases, the decisions were made by the judges without regard to the court rule that requires a hearing on that. And so we went into court, our lawyer went into court and and filed a motion to unseal all of these impounded cases. And the judges who took those uh, motions had to unseal them simply because the, the rules hadn't been followed. So the court has since changed its rules on that. In terms of transparency generally, uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. It depends which state you're in. I mentioned Florida where Marty Barron came from. Virtually everything is public. The public has a presumed right to every document. In a state like Massachusetts, the legislature, the judiciary, and the governor's office are all exempt from the public records. And, and we're one of the worst 
worst states in, in the country. And, but but we're, news organizations are starting to report this as if it's the public being screwed, not the press. And it is the public that's getting screwed because why are we, get, why are we trying to get these documents? So the public can know what's going on. So it's a mixed bag. Yes, sir. What's your prescription for uh, not only the press, but for us as academics? How do we retain not only the value, but find the economic incentive to keep these investigative units going? Well, um, I, I wish more editors could think about where their resources are deployed and, and just take one reporter and assign him or her to just break these kinds of stories that, that we don't get otherwise. There are around the country uh, a number of very successful nonprofit investigative reporting uh, efforts. ProPublica is probably the best known of those. But I, I had one of these at Northeastern for a couple of years where I had foundation funding. and. Uh, there was a, a nationwide organization of people who had started up these nonprofits. That organization is now effectively gone because most people who are good at doing reporting aren't very good at raising money. <laughs> and they had to go raise money locally and a whole bunch of them have gone, have gone under. I think, um, you know, w one of my favorites is, I don't know if you're familiar with the Texas Tribune, which has filled a huge gap in in, in Texas, not doing solely investigative reporting by any means, but they, they've taken on effectively a, um, a, an NPR model where they have sponsors. And, and lo and behold, it turns out that virtually every business in Texas has interest in the state capital in Austin, and they have an interest in knowing what's going on. So everybody, uh, I've forgotten how much they, they raise now, but uh, but if people are, organizations are paying and they're, they're disclosed uh, to help support this, this organization. Uh, the long, as, as you know, as many of you know here, the long-term trend in the news, certainly in the newspaper business, which I know a little bit more about, uh, is really, it's awful. And, and um, no, nobody's been able to, to figure out a, a way to, to stop the revenue from dropping. I mean, we, we have a situation where Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, and that's a good thing. He doesn't have to make money. The owner of the Boston Red Sox three years ago bought the Boston Globe, um, and that's a good thing because he doesn't want to make money. He wants to publish a good newspaper. But we just went through a 10% cut in the newsroom because last year he was losing money on it. And so even even that sort of arrangement, you know, maybe, maybe might might keep our newspaper, you know, with a bigger staff longer than others. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there is a prescription. Yes, sir. As someone who volunteers with survivors of sexual violence, I just want to thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for the work that you've done. Your articles were a paradigm shift in the fight against sexual. I think everyone here knows that the abuses within the Catholic Church are still happening, as is the shuffling around of priests. Um, I will respectfully disagree with you that the Catholic Church has made any substantive efforts to curb that, even in recent years. But I'd just like to ask your personal opinion. What would you like to see the Catholic Church do differently in response to sexual abuse within its ranks? Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for speaking up. Um, First, I don't know that we're in disagreement. I, I live in Boston, where actually there probably been more done in Boston. I will say, and I, I know we'll agree on this, that most of the changes that have been made uh, have been made at the point of a gun, so to speak. Um, threats of lawsuits, uh, chances of, of going, uh, going bankrupt. Uh, what I regret most that I think should have been done could have been done uh, if the officials we elect really represented our represented us. Is I think a whole bunch of bishops and cardinals should have been indicted and sent to jail 
for allowing this to go on for so long. And there were so many cases where that could have been done, including Boston, and prosecutors blinked. That's what I regret the most. And I think if something like that had happened, I think the church would have, would have changed, uh, would be forced to make changes more quickly. We have the same problem with banks. Are you, are you saying the people who caused the, the economy to collapse didn't go to prison? <laughs> The economy's back, so it's okay. Right? <laughs> collections are up at the Catholic Church, right? So it's okay. Not so much. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Um, I've heard that there are some people, specifically at BC High, Boston College High School, who felt that they were inaccurately portrayed in the films. Yes. Do you feel that they or anyone else in the films were inaccurately portrayed, either because the director disagreed or for the sake of just making the film more exciting? Yeah, that's a good question. There's actually a story today where the filmmaker <coughs> faced with a possible lawsuit. Well, let me back up and start there are, there are four people that I know of who are portrayed in the film who are not happy with how they came across. One of them is our former publisher. And uh, his complaint is so slight and so minor uh, that I, I, I said I said this a couple of weeks ago, I regretted it, but since I said it and it's up on, on the web, I'll say it again. He made a fool out of himself by writing a, writing a story about how he had been defamed in this 30 second uh, scene in which he tells the new editor, you know, 53% of our readers are Catholic. And he also says, you know the church will fight us on this. I mean, something you'd expect the publisher to say. But anyway, uh, <laughs> to get to the point you raised, um, the, the spokesman for BC High, which is my alma mater, <coughs> objected strenuously to his portrayal in, in the one scene where, and the scene is based upon uh, my recollection of that of Sasha Pfeiffer, we were both there. And we went to find out what was it that the Jesuits knew in the 1970s about this one priest. Did they know he was abusing children? And, and this guy, Jack Dunn, who's the uh, PR person at Boston College, uh, and is a very aggressive PR guy, in that session tried to dissuade us from the notion that they knew back in, in the 70s. He was doing what a PR guy does. He was trying to basically limit the damage of the story that was coming. So I, I didn't pay much attention to the scene. I saw the screenplay before the film was made. And, and then the film came out, and he called me up and said that he went to see it, and he went outside and threw up. And then he hired a lawyer, and he threatened to sue, and he, he claimed that the scene made it appear that he was part of the cover. -up. And so finally, yesterday, the film company released a statement saying he wasn't part of the cover. Not that I think the film you know, probably said more than you needed to know there. But I, I'm, I'm kind of astonished that, that, that I mean, if this is not, it's not a transcript. It's not a documentary. It's, it's a movie. And so when you think about it, every scene, the dialogue is written by the screenwriter, screenwriter, based upon the research they've done. So it's, does it, is it 100% accurate in reflecting precisely what happened? Couldn't possibly. So, so that was uh, too long. Uh, did I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, next week. Yes. Uh, you mentioned the I guess I'm sort of lame now. I'm actually a graduate of UMass Boston, right across the street from the Globe offices. Um, I think one of the most overblown tropes in Boston movies lately is that everybody knows everybody and everything, but is so tight-lipped and doesn't want to rat on everybody else. Um, but I guess there's also some truth to that in some ways. I guess, did you find in your questioning of people that there were more people that didn't want to talk to you about these things? I guess this might be a silly question, but as opposed to if you were in some other culture, some other city, do you find that it was more difficult trying to get people to come out with these, uh, with these stories? Does that make sense? 
I, I think once people, and this would apply particularly to the, the attorneys mm. who have been involved in these confidential, confidential settlements and who themselves were bound by confidentiality. And, and, and each of them had a piece of the puzzle, a couple of actually fairly large pieces. But I think when they understood, when we, had, when we did our reporting and kept doing our reporting and went back to them, when they understood that the problem was of a much greater dimension than, than they could have realized themselves, then they decided to, to help us. Now, I'm not sure whether that answers your question. I don't think Boston would, would have been any, um, any different. I think um, one of the points that the film makes is that, you know, the Globe faced a fair amount of pressure from, as, and certainly I did, as, as, uh, as, as someone who happened to be somewhat connected, even though I was at that time a lapsed Catholic. Um, uh, I don't think that's much different than, than any other community where those kinds of pressures are there all the time. Yes. In the lengthy time that you did the work to report, did you ever feel a sense of someone else might get this story first before we do? That the competition there drew or drove what you had to do or formulated what you had to do? Or did you really feel that you were so far out there ahead of anyone else that you weren't facing the competition? Well, actually, the answer to both questions is yes. Um, number one, we've all the time felt the pressure. I mean, Boston is one of the few cities in the country uh, left, and maybe three or four, that actually has two newspapers. Uh, the other paper is now down to about seven or eight reporters, Boston Herald. But back then, they were still a force, and they always loved to find out what we were doing. In fact, the Herald used to file Freedom of Information Act requests of state agencies asking for Freedom of Information Act requests filed by the Globe. <laughs> that's, how, that's how they come in front of them. So, so we, were, we were fearful that we'd get school. Um, in fact, there's a scene in the movie where I have to calm down Mark, well, who did I calm down? Mike Rosendez or Mark Ruffalo. Uh, and the actual decibel level in real life was a little lower than, you know, it could have been you, it could have been me, you know. <laughs> But, but, but he, he was trying to lead a charge among the reporters. We've we got to get this out there now. And at that point, we were actually so far ahead that we did have a holding story just in case, but we felt we could risk it. And we were talking about another six weeks at that point. Um, but but we, we just had so much information, and we had connected to so many people that if the other if the, the Herald or anybody else had started to call, we would have found out immediately because people would have called us. So, <laughs> Yes, sir? Uh, this sort of follows on that and also an earlier question about the culture of the newsroom in Boston. Um, there's a couple of scenes I remember. There's one what I call the dead rat scene where you're down in the bowels of the building going over the direct with the team kind of away from other ears. Uh, if I recall right, there's some places where other reporters not of the team would wander in and you kind of shoot them away. Uh, was that a concern and was part of that what was brought up earlier about the heavy Catholic concentration of people in the newsroom, just a little concern of, you know, maybe somebody loose, loose lips sink ships and they let this out before the east of it? Well, first, the rats are real. <laughs> As far as I know, they didn't have to call central casting. Uh, uh, but but the, the, the investigative team, the Spotlight team, uh, was formed in 1970, and it always operated outside the newsroom. We were, in fact, on a different floor um, where the rats were. And, um, and we always operated in, in secret because the last thing you want, want on a major investigation is for word to get out of the building. And if people in the newsroom had nothing to do with people being Catholic, if, if other reporters in the... There's no group of people I know of on Earth who gossip more than reporters. <laughs> and it's, and so so that, that's why. So when we started to publish on that first story, um, 
I, I think probably 98% of our newsroom employees had no idea that story was coming. Okay, so that, that was as closely held as we kept it. Yes, ma'am. You had 18 months or longer of dealing with horrible, horrible stories and devastating news and devastating injustice. How did your team process that and deal with that? And how did, how did that change you over time? Well, it made us uh, favorite guest speakers at the DART Center for Trauma Reporting. <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean to make light of it because uh, it was a particularly difficult uh, time for us. I've done shorter stories that are devastating and yeah. they're yeah. devastating to my own psyche, yeah. You know, my, my wife, uh, who's a nurse, thought that we all had a little PTSD. I don't think that's the case, but uh, but, I mean, have, having to basically spend, I mean, look, I, I, I'll, I'll be, can we put this off the record? <laughs> I mean, they were, they, were, they were, I cried. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a tough guy. I had a reputation as a really tough reporter, but there is there, there's, there's a scene when I went to Providence and where Michael Keaton interviews the guy in the cafe, I actually interviewed the guy in his office, and we both ended up in tears. And and that that wasn't that didn't happen a lot, you know. You're a reporter, you you know, you, you're trying to be as professional as you can, but but it's hard not to uh, it's hard not to have some emotional connection to. Uh, people who have had such harm done to them. Uh, so, so it was a tough, uh, tough reporting. And, and you know what's happened in the last two years has brought it, um, brought it back. I mean, it's mostly in a good way because this, I think, is an important, um, important film. Uh, but it, yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough reporting, and uh, you know, to do it in a concentrated way for that long period of time takes some toll. Yes, in the back. What would you say to Catholics who are just like embarrassed or ashamed of the practices that they've been following? I can't, I can't hear you. What would you say to the Catholics who are embarrassed or ashamed to what has happened, like being Catholic? I can't well, know. I mean, I, I think, and this is a good thing, that the vast majority of Catholics First of all, the vast majority of priests did not abuse children. Now, 10%, 9% is still totally up. So I think people uh, have been able to differentiate the institution from their faith and their church. And by their church, I mean the one they go to on Sunday, the priest who ministers to them and their families. Uh, people have been able to make that distinction. Obviously, the church has lost uh, a fair number of, of people, including my wife, who's now an Episcopal, Episcopalian. Um, and they've lost, people don't give them as, as much money, but I think the distinction is made. And, and one thing that surprised us, you know, we expected a little blame the messenger uh, phenomenon, there was none of that. And even conservative Catholics who we thought, who number one, didn't like the globe to start with, uh, when the story started to tumble out in 2002, actually, we got a lot of calls from conservative Catholics thanking us for helping root this cancer out or trying to root this cancer out of the church. Why don't we take maybe two more questions? Well, in the way, way back. So, in the movie, it looks like you already knew some of the people, like Jim Sullivan, and you know, uh, and uh, you could have the connection at at your old high school, how much did that help your reporting? Well, it helps and it hurts. You know, I had spent my career trying to keep an arm's length from from uh, people I dealt with, uh, and then all of a sudden we get assigned to this story, and I turned around and all of a sudden I said, "Oh my God, I know a whole bunch of these people," and including uh, at the at the Boston premiere, one of these lawyers who actually gave us the names of thirty of those seventy priests. Uh, uh, came up to me and reminded me of that, and I said, Paul, do you want to go public now? And he said, no, no. <laughs> but but it, here's a guy I started playing golf with regularly in 1992. 
and and all of a sudden, 2001, I turn around and he's like, knows a lot, and he, you know, it. So it was a little touchy at times, but I think it helped much more than ever. Yes. I'm a freshman student here in the journalism school, and um, do you believe the journalism has really gotten away from its like core root of muckraking, as it was originally? Good question. You know, I, has journalism gotten away from its core rule of muckraking? Yes, sir. I, I don't know if we've ever gotten close to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, I, I think there's been a tabloidization of American culture in the last, nothing to do with the internet, in the last two or three decades that, that has managed to shift a fair amount of resources uh, from the kind of journalism I'd like to see done to the kind of journalism that, well, you know, covers movies. I can say that now, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you show up at the red carpet, you'll be amazed. I mean, there, there'll be 50 photographers there, and you look at them, and, the, and they're not there, they're being paid by someone, and you think, well, well, if these 50 people could be out doing news. <laughs> yes? I teach high school journalists, um, many of whom end up here. Uh, what would you say to high school kids who are trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives? I mean, of course, I want them to pursue yeah. this. But um, what, what advice would you give uh, 16 or 17 year old? Well, I'd say several things. First, first off, um, studying journalism is a great thing in a liberal arts environment where I think you emerge with the kind of ability to communicate that will help you no matter what you do. And second, it's fun. There's no more fun than being the first person to find something out. It, it's, you, you can't beat it. And, and kids today, and I found this true with my students, and I'm sure it's true with students here, they're much more entrepreneurial than, than I was and my compatriots were at our age. You know, they think much more than even some editors and reporters at, full, at large newspapers. They, they're able to think through the various platforms and the skills they need. Um, so there, there, there are jobs there. We're going to figure that somehow we're going to figure this out, and and people who really want to do this kind of work will do it. And and it's, you know, the money. We must not forget the money was never great. <laughs> okay. It's not great for high school teachers. It's not great. <laughs>